now to share screen. Are you seeing me? All right, I'm up and running. Participants three, four people are signing in. Yeah. Hey, you see
All right, can you guys hear me? All right, can you post in the chat if you can hear me now? Because I just unmuted myself. I can't hear you. Okay, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, good, good, good. Let's give it just a couple um, more minutes and then we'll get started. We had about 89 people, I think, register for tonight. And uh, I know it's kind of the dinner hour. Well, I'm right at six o'clock, so I'm sure people are just kind of wrapping up. But we'll give it just a couple more minutes and then uh, We'll get started. Thank you, first of all, for signing up for my first webinar. I'm pretty excited about this. I've done this as a seminar um, throughout the tournament year this year, and, and uh, Tom Branch at Navionics asked me to present it as a webinar in his series at Navionics, so I'm pretty honored and pretty excited to be doing this tonight. All right, well, we're going to get started because we don't want to drag it out too long. This is There's a lot of information that I'm going to cover tonight. And I will tell you in advance that you may want to take a couple of notes because I have some pretty incredible prize packages to give away um, from my sponsors that helped me put this webinar together. So there'll be kind of a question and answer when we get to those points. I'll have you type in the, uh, the answers and the first one to get it done. Then you'll email me at capt.halley at gmail.com and I will mail out your packages. So got some pretty awesome hats and uh, we've actually got an avionics lake chip, uh, lake and marine chip that uh, I'm hoping that somebody answers those questions right because that's a $200 value. So all right, let's just go ahead and get started. Um, as I said before, my name is Captain Hallie Burnett, and I run Team Early Detection Casting for a Cure, and I'm based out of Pensacola, Florida. A little bit how I got started. Um, you can go on teamearlydetection.com. I won't bore you with all the details, but there's a pretty awesome documentary on me that Sportsman's Boats did in 2015, and the link is in my media section. So you can kind of go see why I do this and, and why I got so involved and why I'm so passionate about um, team early detection and how all of this works for me. So let's get started. If I can figure out how to get my next slide to go here. Come on. There we go. All right. So like I said before, my title sponsor are Sportsman Boats out of Charleston, Charleston South Carolina. They've been a huge, huge, huge help to me. Um, along with that came PowerPole, SimRad, um, and Boyd's Marine. You can see everybody on the side of my boat. My partner, Robert Gottney there that fishes in the IFA Redfish Tour with me. Uh, he gets to put up with me on a boat most of the summer. So <laughs> we haven't killed each other yet. <laughs> but he's a, he's a great man and a great fisherman. And he's also a veteran of uh, the US Army and uh, proud to have him as a member of Team Early Detection. I uh, love my military people. All right, so here's my son, Zane. This is where this all kind of gets started. And I am indebted beyond belief to all of the guides and anglers and my sponsors and, and obviously Zane, who's helped me kind of figure this whole redfish thing out. Um, it's not complicated. And I think after tonight, you'll have a little bit better insight why fish bite and why they don't and where they bite and, and where they live. It's uh, science is pretty fascinating to me. And I think once you put it into play, um, when you're out fishing, um, any of the bass fishermen that are here, I've had several bass people attend some of my seminars, and they uh, they really made the connection between redfish and bass when this was over. So anyway, we're really going to talk tonight about the science behind the strategy and the importance of dissolved oxygen when you're finding and catching redfish. And then at the end, we're going to kind of wrap it all up about how keeping a log and understanding all those notes that you make what a huge difference it can make because I'm sure a lot of you guys have a honey hole that you've gone and you've had some pretty good success at, you know, how whatever your percentage rate is of hookup 
I've done that myself. And then I keep going back and going back and going back and going back. And, and I just couldn't figure out why they weren't always there. Well, they were close. And uh, it had a lot to do with the oxygen level and the clarity of the water and the temperature and, and uh, why their habitat is why that's a good habitat in the summer and spring and maybe not so much in the fall and winter. So I really want to focus tonight on, on how to find the redfish in the first place. And I'm no expert by any stretch of the imagination. I'm still learning this myself. I just finished up my second year on the pro tour and this is my third year of competing with artificial baits, but my success rate has gone up exponentially just by me focusing on what's going to make me better. And, and uh, I started out asking everybody where they caught fish and I still do <laughs> because if they want to give me advice, I will definitely take it. But then I'm figuring out why they're there and why they bite and when they bite. And it really does have a lot to do with these factors. So first of all, we're going to cover the water clarity, water movement, water temperature, your light level, dusk and dawn. And then all of those things are going to be kind of tied in with how to really read redfish water. What I like to call it is I know guys like Fred Myers and, and, and Barney White and Chad Dufresne and any of these guys, if you've never heard of them, that it's unbelievable because those guys can pull up to a spot, Greeter Griffin, they can pull up to a spot and see if there's going to be fish there or not. Because whether they understand all of this, and I'm sure that they do, they get what that water is supposed to look like for those big fish to be sitting in there. So, and then on land maps, we'll touch on that a little bit. That's a pretty complicated subject for one webinar, but we'll touch on it a little bit and you'll get to see what are the signs and what you're going to look for. All right. So we all know and we assume that fish need clean, cool, oxygen rich water to survive, right? So why is that? Well, clean water holds more oxygen. Makes sense. And we'll talk about the sediment levels in water a little bit and why that kind of chokes the fish out a little bit. And if it's cooler, it even holds more dissolved oxygen, right? So clean and cool are your two big things. And uh, chances are, I'm not telling you there's going to be big hammers in there, but there's going to be fish and you will catch them if you can find at least those two things. Then we're going to touch on current a little bit. But just think about this. If, if you walk into a smoke-filled room or a bar or a restaurant or wherever, or there's a four, you're driving down the highway and a forest fire's going, or you know somebody's burning off their pasture. How horrible is that as a human for you to have to breathe that? Well, put that into fish terms, and you have sediment-filled water. They don't want to be there either. They they can't they can't breathe. They can't move right. None of it, and it slows the water current down. It slows everything down, and so when you pull up, you're like, the water's dirty, they're not there. Well, that's why, because that sediment is taking up that space where that dissolved oxygen needs to be, and that's why the fish have moved on. All right, so this, this, is, a, this is a little bit of a, a kind of a science representation of what I'm talking about, but you can see the parts per million of the dirty water versus the clean water, right? So if you have 9.0 parts per million of dissolved oxygen in your water, abundant fish populations, which is why the Gulf of Mexico and some of these places have just incredible fisheries or, you know, and lakes too, but we're talking specifically about redfish tonight. So, but the key on here is, and it's, it seems a little confusing, but it's not, that sediment oxygen demand is a, diff, is a significant sink for dissolved oxygen. What that means is that when you have sediment in the water, it sinks the dissolved, the level of dissolved oxygen, right? So that's a significant sink when we're talking in scientific terms about how that affects the fish, fish population. So on, on the bottom, if you look at this chart, the more sediment, the less dissolved oxygen you have. That's why dirty water doesn't hold fish. And it will at times, but catfish and sailfish, and we've all caught that stuff when we're looking for reds because those fish move in because they, they're just nasty. <laughs> but, all right, now we're going to talk a little bit about water movement, and this has to do with the lunar cycles and how the pull of the moon and the sun and everything affects on your moon phase, tides and currents and all of that. And if you look at this picture, this is actually back behind my house. And it looks picture perfect, calm, and still, right? That reflection is like the water's not moving. 
But if you look at those ripples in the water, that's tide movement. That tide is moving in and causing a current. So I'll explain that to you a little bit more. But when you, when you see really slick water like this, there's water moving underneath that surface. It may not be so much on the top, but how, how everything moves in and out of the Gulf of Mexico or the Atlantic or the Pacific or wherever you're fishing at, that water may not be um, it may be moving more than you need. All right. So now I touched a little bit on it about the difference between tide and current. Okay. They're not the same. They influence one another, but they're not the same. So I just got a message from Tom Brandt to arrow over. <laughs> He's going to have to tell me more. Uh, I'll keep going and he can uh, send me a more detailed text. But so tide is your vertical movement of water, right? That's when the water comes in and it pushes up and pushes up and pushes down when it falls. Tide is vertical movement. Current is horizontal movement, okay? So if you look at this tide chart that I have in here, you can see that's the tide, but when it falls, that creates current. So when you're at the top of those peaks or at the bottom of those peaks, they call that slack tide, right? And I'm sure I'm, I'm preaching the choir a little bit for all you guys, but um, the, the angle of that movement coming off of the tide of how hard it's gonna fall or how hard it's gonna rise is how much that current is gonna push, right? So your best times to catch redfish are right after that starts to fall, because that water is going to start moving and that's going to trigger that aggression feeding in redfish. And then when it gets down low, it's going to slow down and then it's going to go back up. That's how you can time your, your fishing trips. And in tournaments like with us, a lot of people I know like bass anglers, they, you know, they have really, really fast boats and they want to get to the spot first, the brush pile or whatever. Well, what I've learned with fishing for redfish is that you're really fishing that tide. So say you're in Apalachicola, there's five tide stations. So you can be sitting at one tide station and it's maybe at the peak or maybe way at the bottom and you're not getting a lot of my water movement. So you can click on your, like with my Simrad unit, I have a tide chart and I can pick up every single one of those. And I know if I have to run 15 miles to catch that tide change, I'll do it, right? Because I'll know that the, the bite's gonna be there better than where I'm sitting. So in my opinion and I, everybody has their opinions about how all this works, but when I'm tournament fishing for redfish, I'm looking for the most water movement and the, and the tide and the current and how it's all working. And if I get there and the water's dirty, then I'm picking another, I'm picking another area where I have found fish and fishing that and fishing that tide and fishing that water movement. So that's, that's kind of how all that works. Um, but then there's other factors that we, that we always have to take into place too. And I'm going to show you some really good picture examples of what happens in a Scambia Bay where I live. So the wind impact, because what we just talked about can completely go out the window when you have a big weather event. It can completely change how those tides work because the wind is that powerful that it can work against how that moon and, and how all that, the lunar phases, affect a body of water, especially if it's shallow. I mean, shallow water like Escambia Bay or like Panama City, East and West Bay, that water can drain out in a heartbeat. Louisiana, the marsh with the north wind, yeah, you're gonna get stuck. <laughs> Chances are pretty good, even with an incoming tide because that wind will push that water out. Um, air pressure impact with hurricanes and cold fronts, that's, that's all the same thing too, is that when you, that barometric pressure and, and with redfish, because of their air bladders, if you have a low pressure system that comes in, those redfish can feel that. And they always talk about before a thunderstorm or, you know, and it takes a, several hours afterwards for the fish to start eating again. But before that, those fish can feel that barometric pressure and it starts to squeeze on their air bladders. So they know that they're not gonna get to eat for a while. So they start gorging themselves before that storm. And that is the science behind why fish feed really heavily before a weather event because it's all about how that 
affects their air bladders and they know because once that low pressure system hits, they're gonna go deep. They're gonna go lay down and, and equalize those air bladders and, uh, and get comfortable because they, they don't like how that weather affects them. So let me show you a couple of real quick pictures about dramatic extremes that have happened in Pensacola in the last six months. All right, so this was just before Hurricane Irma when the outer bounds were coming in on the storm and this is wind impact, okay? So we got the clean edge of the storm and Jacksonville got the bad side of the storm. So this was before, this is my backyard before, this is just wind and we had high incoming current, incoming tides. So to Jacksonville during this whole time, this is what happened to my backyard in about six hours. And on the other coast where they were getting the, those bands that were coming in, Jacksonville was, if you watch the news at all, was getting absolutely flooded. And they had incoming tides with a dirty side storm and it just filled the city with water. So why do we talk about that? Because, and this, this is kind of the extremes on this, but those fish know and feel all that. Those fish that were up underneath my pilings four hours before that, they went out and they found a hole to lay in. They're still there. They didn't go that far away. They're still there, but they, nature controls everything that they do. All right, so here we have a low pressure impact. This was the next hurricane that came in like a week later. I don't remember what its name was, but same yard. You can see the pilings. That's just a normal water level for my torn up Hurricane Ivan dock. Um, as soon as that hurricane got over the top of us, my house was underwater. So again, that's just explaining to you how those weather systems change and what that's why your fish move so that honey hole for them where you found them that first time, they've got five more honey holes and they all base it on what this weather is doing because they're going to go find the most comfortable spot that they can be in. I've had them come up under my house. When we've had flood tides like this, I know that Jacksonville, St. Augustine, that whole coastline, when they have flood tides, they, the red fishing over there is insane because all those little hermit, like I have hermit crabs and everything that live up in the sand in my, under the grass in my yard. And those fish will come up and feed like crazy because they get flushed out when that low pressure system comes in. Here's an example. This is cold, cold, cold winter day in Florida. High pressure system came in and again, like the low pressure system raised it up, raised the water up. We literally could walk, my son and I walked probably 200 yards out into Escambia Bay because there was nothing. It was just frozen mud as far as the eye could see. But there was guys out fishing that next day in the mouth of the Escambia River, and all those fish were stacked in that river channel, and uh, they, they had a heyday. So, again, sometimes the honey hole's up underneath my house. Sometimes it's back, back in the river mouth. They never, it's my understanding from my friends at the Coastal Conservation Association that those fish really never travel, other than the big breeders that go in and out of the Gulf of Mexico and stuff, but when those slot reds and they're growing and they're schooling up, they stay within kind of a two mile radius. So if you found fish, take a compass or whatever and, and look and kind of find where you think those fish are going to go and hide. And chances are you're going to, you're going to figure out their patterns. You have to, Mark Cowart did a uh, really good article on the Redfish Tournament Central about patterning um, winter redfish and everything he said, and it was very true. Um, so go check that out too on, um, Redfish Tournament Central, their blog. All right, so now we kind of come back to the whole current. We've talked about the pressure systems. We've talked about all that. What are all these weather systems doing? They're causing currents because you're dealing with, you're dealing with the tides, you're dealing with the wind, you're dealing with the pressure systems, but you saw how dramatically that water moves. It's constantly moving and creating current with all these different factors, okay? So, when you have just a, a, a calm movement, those fish are just gonna kinda lay there and they're just gonna, they're gonna put their nose into it and they're just gonna wave back and forth. And I've actually seen this over um, by Hurlburt Air Force Base. They, there's a big sand flat and when the current's falling, those redfish will just sit on that flat and wait. And if you go up about 200 yards, there's gonna be a wad of bait that's just nestled in staying there as long as they can because that when that water gets low that bait train is going to come down and those fish are just sitting there waiting for it so 
there's a lot of different philosophies in fishing for redfish. Do you sit and wait? Do you pattern them and do you sit and wait? Some people do that. They're highly successful at that. I like to kind of run around. I kind of like to run and, and go and I like to blind cast. I'm trying to get better at sight fishing, but there's, there's a lot of different methods. And once you figure out what these, what these fish are doing and how that tide and current and all of that is working for you, you literally can go sit in one spot. If you know that those fish are going to be back because they will, because they don't sit still, right? They're swimming, 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 and they have their little pattern and they know where all their bait is. So that you just have to figure out what works best for you. But again, that current, whether it's from a pressure system or from a wind event or a rain event, there's going to be fresh water coming in behind that. And what does fresh water have? It has dissolved oxygen. It has a higher level of dissolved oxygen. So um, it, all, it all kind of starts to make sense once you think about where you've caught fish in the past. One of the things that I like to, I really have gotten good at this year is fishing eddies. And I kind of learned that after following some of the kayak, the big national kayak fishermen around as a camera boat for the IFA kayak championships. And um, I'm not going to tell you where they were, but seeing how those guys fish and look for those big bull reds, you look at this, this is like a river eddy, but it works in the intercoastal, it works anywhere. You can see where if there's a tree or anything laying down, if you look back behind that, there's going to be fish sitting in there. May not be redfish, it could be trout, whatever. Depends on what you're targeting. But for me, I'll go throw in if I catch a couple trout, I know I need to move. There's also big holes, there's piles of rocks, and I'll show you in my next screenshot. Um, you go, you go with your with your sonar and you start looking and you see piles of rocks and you figure out the way that that current's moving, you're gonna find fish laying back behind there because they're lazy. They they want to just dart out. They want to lay there, and when that bait train comes by them. They just want to reach out and grab it. That's why, especially in Louisiana, that's why they get so big and fat because they don't have to move very far to get a really good dinner over there. All right, so here's, here's a close-up example and a personal example um, of a screenshot. I was on a, that same sand flat and I found this big pile of rocks, okay? So when I took the screenshot and I brought it back to the house and I studied it, look at all that bait fish sitting back there. Like they're hiding because they know they found this little structure and you can be, you can be out in the middle of anywhere. You, some of those big bull redfish, they'll, they'll be, they'll be hanging out behind that stuff too, because they know that those bait are going to be there. They'll come swim around that and just wipe out. Watch for dolphin. Watch the way dolphin are feeding. If they're out some, it looks like there's nothing there. There's structure that's holding fish and those dolphin are, they're capitalizing on that because they, they don't want to work hard for their dinner either. So, um, Never, never discount when you see a big flat, a grass flat, or a sand flat, or anything. Look, it doesn't have to be rocks. It can be a, a hump of grass. It can be bridge pilings. It can be whatever. But fish that back side of those, and uh, you're going to find you're going to find fish. These actually ended up being really nice little mangrove snapper that were hang, hanging back there. Not what I was looking for, but it was dinner, and I found fish. So let me go to the next one. All right. So here's. And, and I'll go into more detail on this in the Google Maps part, but if you look at this picture, you can see the direction of the current. This is at the mouth of the Escambia River. So many people go buy crab traps. They're like, oh, there's not going to be anything. There's not going to be anything. But if you look at that, what we've talked about, about structure and current, clear water, moving water, I picked a really nice redfish off right in between that crab trap and that buoy, that floating buoy. There was a rope there. And he was just literally, I watched him. I could stand on the tower on my boat and I watched him. He was just darting out. And so I, I pitched in a little egret wedge tail in there and popped it like a mullet and, and I got him. So never discount any kind of structure when it comes to fishing for redfish, particularly in Florida. Now this is where I primarily fish. So I know you guys are some, some of you guys are probably from the other coasts and whatever else or Louisiana, but never discount structure when you see it, when you know that that water's, that water holds redfish because you, you'll pick them off of there. All right, so here's where we're going to have a little thing, a little contest. I'm going to turn my chat on. All right, so the first person that can name the six environmental factors that you look for when fishing for a redfish, I have a Simrad gift pack with a visor and a hat, a decal, and a Mojo redfish um, buff and a team early detection sticker pack. 
So if you guys are on and you're paying attention, um, start typing and tell me what those things, six things were that we talked about. And I'll give you just a couple of seconds and uh, then we'll, uh, we'll just keep going on. But Tom Branch is going to be helping me out with this. So again, um, we're also going to do some drawings at the end out of the numbers of uh, everybody who's been signed up for the webinar. So, all right. There we go. Come on. Sometimes this wants to cooperate and sometimes it doesn't. All right. There you go. Water clarity, tide, current, moon phase, water temperature, and light level are your six things. So the first person that typed that in, um, and I'll go back and look at the list when I get done, is going to get that Simrad gift pack. All right. Water movement. We've been kind of talking about this and talking about this. This picture actually was taken by Kent Hickman over in, um, he lives in Lakeland, Florida, and fishes that area. And this is a prime example of how important it is for you to understand tides and current because that person's going to be sitting there for a long time. They'll get out. They didn't damage their boat. They're going to get out, but they, uh, they didn't understand those soundings on your Navionics chart. It's super, super important for navigation. It's super important for fishing to understand what that mean lower low water level means on your charts when you're reading them. I, I've talked to a lot of people. They have great big electronics things and they've got this beautiful map in there and they have no clue what it means. Not only for navigation, but we talked about when those fish start moving in and out of a certain area that you know where they're at, once you figure out what that mean lower low water level means, so if your tide drops three feet and those redfish like, and it's a six foot hole and redfish like to be in three foot and you have a three foot tide drop, go check that hole. Go look at your Navionics chart, mark that spot. And so that you'll know when that tide and that current are moving in and out, where those fish are moving off the shoreline and moving out into those potholes or sinkholes or, or whatever. It's, it's, uh, it's kind of underrated. I think people, everybody likes to fish flats and stuff, but, I think the guys that really do a super job, they understand um, the topography of the bottom of the ocean, and that's what makes them really, really successful. Let me see. I've got someone who answered it. All right. Nobody's got the answer to the question yet. All right. It's going to change here in a minute. All right. Here's an example of that. If you look at this area, it's outside of um, Carabell, Florida, way, way, way over to the, to the farthest, probably the um, farthest east that I probably fish, other than if I trailer and go, but I'll run this spot all the time. But look at, the, look at how, that, how that, the floor of that area, that particular area, look at, how, look at how different it is and all the channels and the cuts and all those things that are there. That's why this is like a redfish mecca. Some are big, some are not. Some, I mean, it just depends. It's right in the Gulf of Mexico. So things, um, there's a lot of water movement. There's a lot of predators. Um, there's turtles and stuff everywhere. And I'm sure you guys probably have found spots like this where you're at. But if you'll see where my boat is, I kind of zigzagged back and forth. And I, I kind of knew I was looking for about that two to three foot water level and the way, the, the way the tides were. And I, you can see where my boat stopped. And as soon as I cast up there, I had beautiful, beautiful redfish. And there was a school of about probably 20 of them just sitting there milling around. And they were eating all the shrimp and stuff that was coming around that island. So it does make a difference for you to be able to figure out those maps and, and your tide levels and what level of water those fish want to be in. And so here's, I watched this webinar, actually, I'm not going to get into a whole bunch more of the Navionic stuff because Mark O'Neill just did one and it was actually, I think, on walleye fishing or bass walleye, I think. And, uh, but making your own maps, and I learned this when I was in Venice for the IFA championships, is that when you, at the mouth of the Mississippi River, how everything changes and shifts around and moves stuff, you can actually do your own sonar charting live go back to your room and it may or may not, you can overlay it on the current charts um, for whatever you're using, but you can overlay it and you can see how those sandbars and things have shifted. He does an incredible job of explaining sonar charting live and how it works. Um, so I really encourage you to go on to the navionics.com and watch that, 
that his particular webinar. Okay, all right. So here's the big Navionics gift pack. This is worth about 250 bucks. So I really invite you to uh, to answer this. What do the soundings printed on a chart represent? What did we just talk about? MLLW. First person to answer that in the chat section is going to get mailed out that incredible Navionics gift pack. Oh, ooh, I don't want that. How in the heck do I do that? Didn't mean to have my face blow up like that. All right, let's see what we have if we got an answer on that. I think we do. All right. All right. Come on. There you go. The depth at the mean lower low water. So I'll be checking the comment section and I'll see who uh, who won that gift pack from Navionics. And there's some really cool Strike King baits in there, some spinner baits, and it's a pretty good little gift pack. All right, water temperatures, and this is all, you know, it's relative depending upon if you're on the Atlantic or the Gulf or whatever, but pretty typically redfish like to be in that 70 to 90 degree um, water temperature level. So in the wintertime, they're going to stay down in that deep dark, the mud, down in that deep water where that mud's holding all that good, that, the, uh, the water into a, a nice warm level. And uh, then in the summertime, they're going to stay up. It's going to be actually opposite, right? So they're going to have, they're going to be up on those flats in the early morning because it's going to be nice, that nice good 70 to 90 degrees temperature. And then they're going to go hide in the shade. So it's exactly opposite in the summer, winter. Always remember that when you're fishing for redfish. They, they, it's, that comes back to that water temperature. <clears throat> it's really important, more important. And it's not, you know, don't go find 89.99 degrees, but it's, it's, they're going to find that really good, good temperature. Like I showed you that when we had that high pressure front come through and that water, there was no way you were going to find a redfish anywhere near the shore. First of all, there wasn't enough water, but secondly, that water was probably about 40 degrees pushing down. Some of it was frozen. So yeah, they're going to, they're going to move way away from the shoreline and they're going to get down in those river channels. <clears throat> this is just a quick graphic then coming back to our oxygen saturation versus temperature because that's what this whole webinar is kind of about is getting that correlation of why you know they're not going to they're not going to put their their hoodies and their Uggs on when it gets cold right they're going to go find where the best water with the best oxygen that they can move the least amount and expend the least amount of energy and all the bait fish are going to do the same thing so this is in Celsius, but you can see as the as the temperature goes higher and higher and higher, that water look, that oxygen rate goes down drastically. So I just I, I just want you to kind of um, oh can't see my screen. Whoops. I guess I don't know what I did there. Hold on, let me. I just got a message that I can't share screen. There we go. Sorry about that. I must have pushed the wrong button. All right. From current slide. All right. Is that better? I think I got you back. Okay. Now we're down to to light levels, and this is this is this this is the same kind of instant we talk about dust to dawn, dust to dawn, right? Oh, somebody raised their hand, and I will answer questions in a minute. Let's see if we got. Okay, so Aaron Davis said he answered the first question. <laughs> All right, good. I will put your name down, and that was, I believe, for the Simrad Pack. Uh, make sure you email me at capt.halley at gmail.com with your address and your contact information, and I will um, get that out to you. Let me see. Go back up. And then... Oh, let me see, Jamie, who won that one? So Aaron Davis got the first one. And then Jamie McGuire got the second one for the Navionics pack. So make sure that you get in, get a hold of me. And uh, yeah, Jamie McGuire, I'm writing your name down. All right, you, you get the Navionics pack. All right, let's keep going, awesome. All right, so light levels. 
this is the same kind of deal, dusk and dawn. Why, why do you have better luck at dusk and why do you have better luck at dawn than in the heat of the day? It all comes back to water temperature. And your fish are not, like your bait fish and stuff, they're all going to come up. There's not, you know how the, the redfish and all the stuff, they, they come up at night and they come up because all those bugs and stuff, there's not all this light and all this turbulence. And, and honestly, I do believe it has a lot to do with the water activity level with boats and all that stuff too because I've gone out bridge fishing at night and there's, you know, two or three boats versus 30. And so those fish are just more actively feeding and it's, it's, uh, that's why when you tournament fish, when that sunlight, when we have safe light, everybody wants to be gone because they know that that bite, usually sometimes in the summertime by nine o'clock in the morning, that bite's done until um, much later in the day. You know, you can hit or miss on some flats and stuff, but especially in the heat of the summer, you really want to get there as soon as that sun's coming up because that bites, they're going to feed until they're full and then they're going to go lay down in the mud and sleep until they're ready to eat again. All right, let's go here. I don't know why I'm having such a hard time with this moving between things. Okay, and this is this is just all kind of basic. I I don't put a whole lot of credence in it. I mean, I, I do to a point, but you know, people talk about reading the water, or redfish water, or whatever else, and and uh, I don't pay a lot of attention to the birds because I, I just I've never really had good luck with that. Um, Bait fish on the surface, you know, you just never know if you're going to get speckled trout or whatever else. Going to catfish and stuff, they'll all push that up. Or dolphin and stuff, they'll push it up. Truthfully, by looking at the bottom, I always have, if, I, if I'm just looking and the tide's not, I'm, the bite's kind of slow and things are around, if I start seeing sheep's head or stingray, I will stay in that area because there's a really good chance you're going to be able to pick a redfish out of there too because those, they all seem to kind of, go together and if you've watched the fisherman's guide the show it's also in my media link captain ronnie daniels and i were on the water one day in, in the biloxi marsh and we literally were using artificial baits gulps and there was a redfish and a sheep's head together and we both threw in and the red was chasing mine and the sheep's head was chasing his and it, they fought over it and like the sheep's head won and we caught a huge sheep's head on gulp um so there's just a really good correlation in my in my experience. That's what I've I've had the best luck with is just really looking to see what's swimming underneath the surface of the water. The rest of it, you just don't know what's going to be there. And uh, but it's all it all comes from experience and and just I think whatever your confidence level is, I think that always that helps a lot too. So this is actually right on my back beach here just a couple of days ago. That is probably about six inches of water in that dolphin. Um, has a mullet in his mouth and there was redfish going up and down. I, wa I can watch them from my deck. They were going up and down the shoreline and all these little finger mullet were there. And this dolphin literally came up. He almost beached himself. Um, and I've learned from experience too, that once they do that, wait about 30 minutes. Those redfish, they're there for a reason and they're going to come back, but they're going to wait. Cause those, those dolphin are going to keep moving. They're just going to move and move and move. They're just going to tear up the shoreline. But if you wait about 30 minutes, those redfish and all that stuff, they'll kind of come back to that same area. So I've, I've actually had pretty good luck when I see dolphin feeding. I'll, I'll stop and wait, you know, have a Diet Coke, have a sandwich and sit and wait. And I've almost always caught and not tournament winners, right? But I'm just looking for fish. Um, I've almost always caught redfish when there's been a pot of dolphin that have come through like that. But yeah, he, uh, he almost ended up my living room. <laughs> all right. Here's another big thing. Um, and this is where the Louisiana people, and this is why Louisiana is such an incredible fishery. It's also why areas like Apalachicola and parts of East and West Bay and Panama City, and again, because that's just the predominant areas where I fish, I have fished Steenhatchee. And if you go fish on those flats outside of um, Steenhatchee, there are redfish everywhere because this is what the bottom looks like. And I just did a blog article too for um, Redfish Tournament Central talking about um, photosynthesis and there's not there's a reason that they like the grass on the bottom it's because it does provide structure and coverage but it also just gives so much oxygen that's why you can go sit in a pond in Louisiana and it'll seem like the water's not hardly moving at all the fish really aren't moving that much they don't have to because that, those plants are just giving out so much oxygen that those fish can just stay there 
That's why they look like footballs. That's why they call them pumpkin patches over there. If you can find places like that in Florida, send me the GPS coordinates <laughs> because um, there's some really good fisheries in Florida, without a doubt, but our fish have to move farther and work harder and they just don't gain the weight like the Louisiana fish. That was the kind of the aha moment that explained the whole thing to me and it's all about the grasses. And here, my son, who's kind of a hippie when he did this, <laughs> when he was in the Marine Sciences Academy, but we were having a discussion about, and again, this is in the exact spot where you just saw that dolphin feeding, right? Look at all that dead plant material in the back of there. And Zane brought one of his aquarium tools out and he was showing me how low the oxygen level was in that beautiful, clean, clear water. But all of that dead plant matter was just sucking it out as it was degrading on the bottom of the bay in the wintertime. So um, that's why sometimes in the summertime when we have some good grass and things and the tides are right, we can have some good fishing in where I live. But in the wintertime like this, it all that plant matter and all that stuff washes down out of the river and it just completely, we don't even get rain minnows or anything up there at that time of the year because there's no oxygen form. So again, it's the perfect combination, like we talked about, are all those factors, cold water, clean water, you know, oxygen rich, on and on and on. But there's also other factors that play in, like in the wintertime when all those plants and things die off, the water gets cold, you have a high pressure system come in and destroy that estuary till it can rebuild when the water temperatures get up, the fish just are gonna move, they're gonna move again back out to where that bait train is, out into the mouth of the river or wherever they can, you know, find a decent food source and rest and not have to work, you know, to breathe underneath the water. So here's a prime example. Here's <laughs> kind of a blurry picture of selfie, but look at that grass. That's in Apalachicola, Florida. Look at how that grass is, how it's kind of sparse and whatever else. I pulled a beautiful eight pound redfish out of there, right? Grass, grass, grass. It was, it was a huge, big kind of a open area, but there was this grass line that had this where they could hide in and I could see the mullet and stuff jumping outside of it. And I pitched right back up into that grass. Redfish love grass. They love plants. They love structure. They love habitat, all of it. And here, the next picture then, different kind of grass, but there's Louisiana. That's a prime example of how you, you just look and fish those grass lines because even if you get out in the kind of in the more middle, there's gonna be pretty good oxygen out there, but the way that water has to move through that grass and the photosynthesis and everything that's happening, those fish literally lay with their noses sticking out of that grass and you pop a gulp or a gold spoon or whatever, spinner bait, whatever you're using, they'll come out and just attack it and then they'll run right back into that grass. Which is why in Florida, back here, I can fish with eight pound braid, 10 pound, I can pull a fish out of that. Okay, Louisiana, 50, 65, because look at how much more dense that grass is and they will go back in there and you have to horse them out. You have to get them out of there. So. Um, Fish are fish and they all have the same things. You just have to know the environment of, you know, kind of what you're fishing in and what, that's a whole nother gear question that we could get into too, but we won't obviously do that tonight. But so anyway, connecting the, the dots, they need dissolved oxygen, period. And once you start identifying those things and looking, and if you don't see anything moving, move on, keep looking, just keep moving and, and you'll find them. Um, and once you figure out that combination for whatever area you're fishing in, you're going to have really good success. I guarantee it. We're going to touch on the maps a little bit. This is, again, um, it can get to be, I could go on for a day about how to use maps and things, and I'm still learning it, but it's, it does make a big difference. Um, they are lazy. They're, they're creatures of instinct and habit, just like we talked about all along. They're going to kind of stay in that same general area. So now instead of being on the water and spending 300 hours a summer like I've done looking, you can go home and look at your maps. Once, pay attention when you're on the water and you're seeing where you're catching fish. Go home and pull up Google or Bing or MapQuest, the, the earth image, the satellite image and mark on there and look, study where those fish were. Because then you can start looking around and eventually you'll make the correlation that okay, they're not going to be here. They're going to be here. And then you can, it really helps on your fishing time to kind of just eliminate stuff. 
and you can go check those other spots. But you'll, once you start really studying those maps and, and understanding what they're telling you, your success rate to go out when your family comes from North Dakota and wants to catch fish, you know, because they think you're wonderful and you catch fish every time you go out, which is not true, but you're going to have a much better chance of being successful. All right. So this is just going to be a quick tutorial on how to use those maps. All right. This again is in my backyard. Okay. You can clearly see that there's a grassy point where that little, and that's what they use to mark kind of estuaries, right? You can see the sandbar coming off of that edge. You can see the channel that's been cut between the two bay systems into in between that, the sandbars and that grass, right? So there's a deep water channel, okay? So keep that in mind as we move forward because that's hugely important about what we talked about. That there's a channel cut in there because the water pressure and the water power are pushing that through and they've, it's made a channel. That means there's current. That means there's moving water all the time in that spot. Okay, so the red marks now that I've added to that are crab pots. Okay, I guarantee you that all these guys that I see out in their crab boats or where, no matter where I'm at, maybe some of them have, have studied maps, but I guarantee you their grandfather's grandfather's great grandfather taught them this way before the maps were ever, that's where they catch crabs, right? That's where they're going to be at. Every one of those crab pots was laid. When I came back and laid my map back out after fishing in this spot and I saw exactly where those crab pots were, that light bulb moment, right? And this comes back to that picture where I told you that I caught that redfish because those fish are, crabs don't free swim. Crabs have to be washed with current. That's why the crab guys know where those, where those fish and all the crabs and everything are gonna be is because those, those crabs and, and the shrimp are gonna be washed with the current. Well, that's where the redfish are gonna go eat them. So never underestimate the power of a crab trap and even if you don't want to fish the trap themselves, you know that those traps are there because that free flowing bait that can't swim um, has to, uh, they have to be washed through that. And uh, yeah, and I do want to bring this up real quick too, is that I use, my son just bought a sailboat and he doesn't have electronics on it yet. So we downloaded the, um, the Navionics app onto his cell phone. And right now you can do it for 14, your trial period is 14 days for free. I think it's $9.99 for the year, even if you don't have the Navionics chip on your boat or whatever, but you need, you need to get one. But um, put it on your cell phone for iPhone and Android. Um, download that app and give it a try and start, because you can mark your waypoints, you can mark all kinds of stuff on there and right in right on your boat and then you can sync it up on your computer it's a, it's a pretty awesome program but it's at navionics.com um, and then you can just go on the itunes store or wherever and, and download that navionics app all right so <clears throat> this is where we're going to kind of all bring it together and i know i'm a little wordy we're pushing on probably about 50 minutes or 40 minutes i guess of here but so now that you've found where the fish are now that you've kind of identified this and you've looked at them that's half the battle because the other thing that you really have to learn about redfish and again everybody louisiana is a little different than florida and everything's different florida redfish are super 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 spooky and you my first year i i had the wrong kind of boat i didn't have the right gear i didn't have anything i was able to find fish but i wasn't successful in catching them and it really came down to the approach that I was using with my boat and the positioning. And that all comes back again to your tides and your current. And we'll go over that just a little bit. And then your lure presentation, you have to, you have to figure out how, like when you're watching mullet, finger mullet jump, you need to find a bait that looks like a finger mullet and jump it because those, the fish are eating that. That's what you have to kind of, figure out um, and we'll talk about it a little bit but again I really want you to focus more on finding these fish and once you do then we're, we're going to take those same environmental situations with the tides and the current and the wind and we're going to apply that to how you approach that spot and how you position your boat to effectively fish that for redfish all right 
And this is again a little bit of a wrap up. Reading Redfish Water, this is what I get back to. All these guys who win boats and they everything all the time, these guys are winning. If you sit and listen to them, they're not going to tell you. You know, you can <laughs> they're not you can ask them where they do and what they do, and some some are pretty helpful, but it's proprietary. They put a lot of time in and you have to respect that. But if you just sit and listen to them and you understand what they're talking about, you can really, I've learned more just by sitting at a picnic table at a captain's meeting or whatever, just listening to these guys talk. Well, this spot and this spot, this spot, and then they'll say some little thing. They'll talk about what was going on or, you know, the tide was doing this or the wind was out of the south, southeast. And you can kind of start to put all of those pieces of the puzzle together with what you're learning by yourself. But <laughs> this is Fred Myers, who's the top, undoubtedly top redfish angler in the United States. He's I won like three national championships and 11 boats and I don't know what else, but he said this to me one time when I was first getting started. He said, trolling motors are a blessing and a curse. And I am the first to admit that I, my first year doing this, I was trolling, 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 right? I was gonna find them. Well, they're gone. You've scared them. That's why these guys with the technical polling skips and that, they have such good luck because they're just ninjas. And you can be a ninja with a trolling motor, right? But you have to set it on one speed. I suggest two, if you're kind of doing a grass flat and you, you really want to kind of cover some water and you're kind of pre-fishing or whatever, and I guess even in a tournament, but three max. Feels like you're not moving at all. But think about it, you're moving at a three and you're ca you got your gold spoon, you got your spinner bait, you're doing whatever. You've got to be able to reel that in before your boat gets to it. So, and when you're just out sight fishing and you're on a tower, one or two, depends on the size of your boat, you know, with my sportsman, with my 234, I can put it on about two and you feel like you're crawling and you are, but you literally can get on top of those fish and sight fish down on top of them because you've become part of the environment and the best, and I don't even remember who it was that explained this to me at one point, but coming back to a base system and you have a river running through it, right? There's always boats here in Pensacola, there's tugboats, there's all Coast Guard boats, there's Navy ships, there's all that kind of stuff. They're constantly going and moving so that those fish are used to that whir of that engine going, right? So if you have your trolling motor and you have it on one or two, that's such a smaller engine and it's just if you keep it on that constant speed and you're not adjusting it and think, think, you know how those, like I use the iPilot, I have the Mincode iPilot, I love it. It's my best friend, I call him Hunter. <laughs> but you can't be constantly moving and shifting that because they can hear that variance. You wanna put, if you have to move it, right? You want to just keep it at a constant speed. You hook up on a fish, that's a different thing, shut it down but don't be moving and constantly adjusting. That's why it's important to understand your wind direction, your current, all of that. The less you can move, less you can use any of that stuff. It's, it's an aid kind of, right? It's not the do all end all. That trolling motor is not gonna catch you fish. It's gonna help you get to them, but it can also be a really big detriment if you don't use it properly. And it, like say you're not jet boat racing down the Indian Snake River, right? You just wanna, Go slow and steady and, and really, really be as quiet as you can. Right, there's a perfect example. You can see how the wind is up on my tower and you can see how I've got my trolling. I am barely, barely, barely moving. I'm on a huge grass flat in Panama City and it's a, it's a well-known flat. It's a fun place to fish, but the way the wind and everything was moving that day and I'm going against it. And you can see off to my starboard side, there's a huge pile of bait out there and that's what I'm casting into. But this is what you don't wanna do. You don't wanna go into the wind. You don't wanna push against it. You don't wanna do any of that. Flip that picture, right? Come down and flow with it if you're just searching and looking for, for fish. Now, and there's, there's a little bit more technical stuff to that too because you also want to present your bait that it's coming down towards you but that's when you power pull, okay? So again, this is, this is a prime example of trying to move against that current with that big of a boat and trying to fish for redfish, I'm not gonna catch anything. And that's why I had that picture taken for this webinar. All right, 
So when I switched that around and I was back on the, I, I turned it around and I started drifting back. The big pink mark is my boat, right? The yellow is where the fish were located at. You can see the black lines are the current coming. So I'm casting, I'm down current, I'm casting up and I'm letting my bait drift back into that yellow hole. That's where those fish were sitting right on that little point. I had the wind to my back. The ultimate perfect setting, if you're gonna fish a flat like this, is to have the wind at your back, your down current, casting up as far as you can and letting that bait drift back past those points and those cuts. That's, the, that's how you're gonna catch redfish. And here's a, here's a picture of what I was actually doing. There's the yellow, see? You can see the current and everything coming down and how I'm casting up into there. I'm power pulled down. Now I'm not trolling motoring. There's, the presentation is always a little different, but I'm power pulled down and I'm casting back up. I got the wind at my back. I got the current coming down and I was pitching up into that grass and uh, got me a nice little redfish out of there. Hey, he's, not, he's not a tournament winner, but he certainly was fun to catch. Um, and here's, an, here's another example of there was a wind drawn current and here I have the sonar chart live. You can see I'd, I'd been out sonar charting that day and I was, I was looking and you can see, look at all those different variances and those ripples coming off of that sandbar. Look at it, it's three, 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 nine, 12 foot holes. There is always fish in this area, always fish there. So I had the wind coming in with the blue marks that you can see again, the yellow is where the fish were. You can see where my boat's positioned I'm casting up around the corner of this and those fish were swimming around. And I, I wish that I'd had more, it was, it was so shallow. I didn't, with the boat that I was on that day, I, I couldn't get in and get my sonar chart just exactly like I wanted it for this demonstration. But this is an exactly perfect, good example of making your own sonar chart. And when I saw all that deep water and those cuts and how those little ledges went down, I knew those fish were gonna be, it's just a little grass, clump uh, kind of out in the middle of nowhere and uh, and there's there it is and you can see again that grass you can see how the wind and the current are coming in I'm down current casting up and see that little eddy that's right there it's a really calm little spot I pitched up right on that little tip on that corner and uh, pulled out a beautiful little redfish on there but again pay attention to the grass pay attention to that because that's that's what they, he was, he was, they're ambushers. That's what they like to do. So, and here's, we're going to talk a little bit power pole. So you guys see power pole, you probably know there's going to be another contest coming up here in a minute, but in windy conditions, um, because we've all had tournament days or fishing days where it's just horribly windy and uh, power poles are, they're just a must have um, if you're going to be red fishing. Um, you always want to have the wind to your back if you can, but it's always more important to remember the way the current's flowing. So if you have to pitch into the wind to be down current, then you just have to keep your rod tip much lower to the water and get underneath that wind because the fish don't really care or know that it's blowing whatever direction up, but they know which way that current's coming in and where their nose is going to come in Here's the current, here's the fish. And if the wind is blowing this way or that way, they don't care. You need to figure out how you're gonna get your bait so it's up here, so it comes down current so that fish can eat it. Always, always fish the currents and the tides. And again, why? Because that's bringing in fresh, clean water and it's that bait train that's gonna follow that clean water because they're gonna be washed with it every time. So anyway, now we're back to, we're back to my, this is, <laughs> I kind of got a little crazy with my markers, but this is where I'm going to show you your boat positioning on that same little island with the red crab traps. All right. So you got your wind coming in out of the north with an outgoing current. So the pink is the current, the wind is the white. All right. So you can see the blue is my boat and those red crab traps. For me to effectively fish this, I had to figure out how I could get, and I was fishing the eddies on these this time. I was fishing behind every one of those crab traps. And you can see I kept the wind to my back. Now, the current in this situation, 
I wasn't fishing the bait with the current. I was fishing the eddy behind the crab trap. So I was more target sight fishing. I wasn't trying to bring bait down with the current. I was, I knew that those fish were sitting with their noses to it. So all I had to do was drop it in front of them. So it, it may seem a little confusing, but that's, you're still fishing that current. It's just your presentation has to be a little bit different when you're in a situation like this. Um, but again, you get your Navionics maps and you study this. So now I challenge you all to go try and find something in an area like this where you fish and look for that cut, look for that current, mark it on your Navionics app, take it out, mark it on your chip in your boat and uh, go try and fish it. And just think about the things we've talked about tonight with that current and where those fish are going to be laying because they're there. They're always there. Again, this is back to that. I'm kind of wrapping it up with this picture because you can see the current, you can see the rope, you can see all of that and uh, bam, <laughs> I was pretty happy about it. Yeah, I actually caught the fish on the little edge of the crab trap and kind of cut him up a little bit. But, um, and I'm actually out away from the grass because of the way the conditions were that day and I wanted to fish those, those eddies behind those crab traps. All right, so here's our power pool question of the day. Do you, pull, you, do you position your boat up current or down current? Okay, I'm getting, I'm getting lots of questions. I'm going to have to go back through these. Um, down. Dean Fowler. Down. Oh, James McGuire. Down. Ralph. Let me see. I got to see who did. You guys are answering so fast. I would have to go back and look. Brian Scrimetti. I know you've already been to a seminar, so you knew that question. I think the first one was Dean was first up. So Dean wins. Okay. <laughs> All right, Dean Fowler. You win the power pole pack. Power pole. Awesome. Thank you guys for playing along. It's fun. I like, I like to, I love to give stuff away. I'm always telling my sponsors, send me stuff, send me stuff, send me stuff, because I will give it away. All right. Come on. Seems like every time I answer a question, it slows it down. Come on. Down current. There you go. Dean Fowler. I'm not even a male yours. I know where you live. All right. <clears throat> so presentation, we're kind of getting to the end of it. Um, the action, the silhouette, color, and casting distance. Everybody kind of has a different take on this. Um, a lot of people say that the action is the most important. I would have a tendency to pretty much agree with that. Um, but you have to have the right silhouette for what's, what you're fishing. Like you have to know what baits are in the water because a pogey has a different silhouette than a crab. I mean, let's be completely opposite, you know, it's opposite day on that. You have to know what they are and then you have to know how to present that kind of bait. Like I talked about with the, with the, with the mullet, the finger mullet, watch when there's redfish feeding on finger mullet, watch how those things, you have to really get a lot of action in that because that's, if you have something that's kind of lazing around, they're like, well, that's not what I'm eating. I'm eating a finger mullet, right? So you have to, the action is important and the still, it's kind of a, a match situation where you have to understand what's there and how those fish are behaving. And then color, um, you can buy 8 million different colors of baits. Um, I think it really has a whole lot more to do with the watercolor than it does the color of the bait because they have to be able to see it. So, and I'll go through a couple of my examples of what I use. And the number one thing of all of it, we talked about boat positioning and approach. If you can't cast 50 yards, I mean, like say again, if you're in Louisiana or you're sight fishing, there's different, but if you're fishing a grass flat, I practice every day. I have redfish targets. I go back in my backyard and I'm not, you know, 30 minutes or whatever and I rig, I'll rig all my rods with a gold spoon one day. I'll rig all my rods with a, a gulp one day. I'll put all of them with an egret wedge tail one day. And I practice and practice and I make notes of what setup gives me the most um, distance. Distance is key because not only can they feel the pressure of the boat and they, you need to be as far, as far away as you can, but you're covering more water. 
you get that bait about halfway back to the boat, just reel it all the way in, unless they're chasing it and you can see it. But you have to be as far away from your boat as you can possibly be. It's all about being a ninja at a hand raise. All of Brian, I'll get with your question here in a minute when we get to the end. But um, again, we all know straight, straight retrieve, jigging, twitching, jerking, or you just you really have to figure out when you when you, if you have a favorite bait and you always have success with it, think about how you're presenting that lure to the fish, because what you're doing is working with that particular bait. You know, people have different methods with spoons. They either, you know, they jerk them or they twitch them or they straight line retrieve them or do whatever. And so it's, I think it comes back to a confidence level and what you're consistent with and that the fish can, I really think that they can, whatever you're doing is making it the most natural presentation for them. And that's what you need to do and figure out with all the baits that you like to use. Because again, there's a million baits out there. You have to, um, you have to use what you're comfortable with and what you're successful with because what you're doing that's making that successful is making it the most natural presentation and those fish are responding to it by, by eating the bait. All right, so these are just a few. I love the egret wedge tail, straight line retrieve all the way back to the boat. That's what I caught in those two previous pictures. Well, three, because I had the one on the crab trap and then the two on the grass lines. I was using the egret wedge tail. There is no need to do anything with these baits other than to retrieve them back to your boat because of that big tail on the back of there the vibrate, you can feel it, especially when you're fishing with eight pound or 10 pound braid, you can just feel that wedge tail moving. I like watermelon green with wet, red flakes. I use a lot of different kinds of baits depending again, um, what's in the water, but I really like that color because if you're, you're fishing a grass flat and it's green, you've got that little flake of red, which I think kind of gives that, like their gills, you think, you think about a fish, they open up their gills. So if you've got this green and, they're seeing flashes of red. In my opinion, I think what they're thinking they're seeing is that they're, they're seeing a live bait fish because those red gills, you know, I could be all wet about that, but it, it, I'm comfortable with it and it works for me. So that's what I do. White's always good. I've never, ever had bad luck with white and the copper penny. So my three big um, colors that I like are the watermelon green with the, with the red flake, white and a, and a copper penny. That's with a soft plastic. Right, and I love gold spoons. I mean, you can't, you can't go wrong with a gold spoon. And here's, this was on another grass flat and that's, he absolutely hammered that thing. And I, I hook it with a big long loop knot. So that wedge tail is just, it's like a dying bait just going all over the, all over the place. And uh, redfish love them. Florida, Louisiana, doesn't matter. They love those fish. They love those baits. Here's um, talking about the white in the, the egret baits bone flash wedge tail um, on those crab traps when those finger mullet were jumping. It's my go-to bait. I may put a little pro cure or they have the shrimp, the voodoo shrimp sauce, whatever, just a little bit, especially if the water's a little bit murky. But that white, that is the closest thing that I found that, that fish will eat like those finger mullet. And here we go. Here's an example. I pulled this up. This is on those crab trap. Look at that picture of that, that mullet and that egret wedge tail. So it's, you got it. You, you kind of got to think like a fish, I guess what I'm trying to say. Copper penny. I think when your water's a little bit, when your water's a little bit murky, just, I mean, everybody uses a gulp shrimp in, in new penny and they use it with the chartreuse sales. There's something about that color. I don't know what it is, but it works consistently. Now, Louisiana, I always like a really, really, really dark bait. And I think because it seems a little contraindicative or whatever, but when that water is really, really dark like that, this is where it comes to the silhouette because that white's going to look a little out of kilter. It's not going to be quite right. But when you have even a black spoon or a, or a black bait like this and that little flash of color on the back with dirty water, again, it seems like it's not how you want to do, but I like a really, really dark bait in dirty water. It, 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 it's what I've been successful with. And then of course, uh, Florida, I don't have a lot of luck. I guess sometimes when it's really rainy and nasty and uh, there's lots of wave action, I can get by with a popping cork in Florida. But in Louisiana, as a matter of fact, Robert Gottney and I, when we, we came in, we were in eighth place the first day of the IFA championship this year and we used popping corks because the wind was blowing it was crazy dirty and on the second day 
Um, we had, we had good weight and then I lost one at the boat. I didn't get the hook set right, dropped my rod tip, total rookie mistake, but we were using popping corks and that's at a national level championship. So don't ever let anybody say, and the voodoo shrimp course, I had a guy, I tell you this funny story because I was out pre-fishing one day by myself and I was actually had gone from Venice to Lafitte and I'd come back to Empire. I went 132 miles that day on my boat and I stopped to refuel in Empire and this old guy, you know, he was taking pictures of my boat and whatever else. And he asked me what I was fishing with. And I told him, and he went and bought me a package and he, I sponsored by egret baits. Right. So I have tons of voodoo shrimp and he uh, went in and bought me a pack at egret baits. And he said, if you win that championship, tell him a coon ass gave you these baits. I just thought it was, it was just funny because the locals use them. I mean, everybody uses those. They're, they're a really good product. <laughs> so again, with the, uh, with the spoon, I always like to put a little bit of the voodoo shrimp sauce on it. Um, there's lots of good scents out there. There's lots of good products, but I just, I just really like the voodoo. It, it works really well for me, <clears throat> but I always put something on a spoon. Some people don't, but um, I like to put a little bit of scent on the spoon, even with that flash of it. I think the, the scent helps out a lot. All right, so here we go for the Egret Bates gift pack. What is the best retrieval method for a wedge tail on a grass flat? I beat it to death. <laughs> uh oh, here we go. It's firing up. Straight retrieve. Jamie McGuire. Jamie McGuire is all over this. I think we'll give that one to. That's your second one. Can we give him two? He got the first. He got the first answer. So he's getting. He's getting it. He's getting two gift bags. Voodoo. All right. Yeah, and that's there's um, some packages of the the wedge tails in there in that gift pack along with a really cool hat. So thank you for participating. Let's see, Come on. straight line retrieve. <laughs> All right, casting distance. I already kind of touched this touched on this a little bit, but. Um, I actually, Dean Fowler, who's on here tonight, um, he lost his sister to breast cancer in uh, August of this year, and he is a custom rod builder. And so for the championship, um, even though I am I'm sponsored by Halo Rods, Dean uh, went way out of his way and built me a custom rod. And I used that thing constantly in the championship and uh, brought me some pretty good luck because we did all right. <laughs> so. But yeah, and I can cast really well with his rod. You just have to find the rod that works for you and you have to figure out what action you like, what you're gonna set the hook best with and everything, but I cannot stress enough and I'm still working on it. Cast, 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 and cast some more and get that casting distance. And when you're sight fishing, you're not doing, you're, you're wanting accuracy. But when you're covering a big grass ladder, like in my backyard, like here, you just want to cover as much water as you can because those fish will come attack it, especially a gold spoon. If you've got that thing out there 150 yards or whatever you can cast, um, you'll catch fish because they'll come and attack that spoon in a heartbeat. All right, so here we go. Connecting the dots. This is what we've talked about all day. This little girl, Kaylin Parks from Topeka, Kansas, came down and fished with me and um, she outfished her brothers. We had a boys versus girls tournament in Pensacola Pass and uh, she crushed it because she was with me. <laughs> but anyway, that's a kind of an ongoing family joke about that, but it ties all of these things together. Use your online maps, you know, fishing early in the morning and it just it all comes together. Your water clarity, your tides, current and moon phase, you know, watch for the bait, the birds and, and what's going on, on, the, on the, in the water behind you and boat positioning and your approach casting distance, it just kind of brings it all together. And so what does all this have to do with dissolved oxygen? Well, if you can't find them, you can't catch them. And if you find them and you don't approach them right, you can't, uh, you can't catch them either. So you need, to, you need to really connect all the dots and, and bring it all together for yourself. And like say boat positioning has everything to do with the current and the water flow and the water flow has everything to do with the location of the fish. And that is because they're getting bait and they're getting food and it's because it's good. It's a good spot for them to, because they have a lot of oxygen and that's just how nature works. So it's kind of a whole simple little process that I use. And uh, so here's Robert and I, this was day one at the IFA championship. We were pretty happy. 
Um, that was in the Venice, Louisiana, great time. And again, if it had not been for my Navionics maps, I was by myself for five days in the marsh and uh, never got lost once, never got stuck. And uh, you, ha you have to have good maps in order to, to find your way around. So um, this is just a little real life example and uh, I won't go into it a whole bunch, but it kind of brings back everything. Uh, my first year of red fishing, this is when I would go out and I would pre-fish and I would catch everything that I could possibly find. And I would go back to the same spot the next day and then zero because I didn't understand the difference, what the wind direction was doing, what the tides were doing, what the currents were doing. This was at Panama City and West Bay Crooked Creek. This is an example of my fishing log. I keep very, very detailed records every time I go on the water. And this is when it all kind of came into just kind of clear view for me a little bit that and then losing some fish in a live well. I'm like, why, how can they die in a live well? Well, because again, it has to come back with making sure that you have pop, proper aeration and you have um, a lot of oxygen. So those fish can lay in there for two days if those, water, if those pumps are working good because they don't need to eat for two days, but they need to breathe. And I, I learned that the hard way with all of this. But so anyway, um, my shirt didn't show up, but we have, from all participants tonight, um, Tom Branch is going to be drawing um, a number, and I have an extra large Mojo Red Fish Finny shirt. Um, I don't know why the picture didn't show up, but anyway, so while we're wrapping up, I, oh, there it is, so it had to show up. Yeah, it's that shirt. Team Diesel Junkies love these two. They're husband and wife fishing team. They're pretty formidable. They get it. They know that estuary over there very well, and uh, they know how to fish it, and they spend a lot of time on the water. So somebody will be drawn for for that shirt tonight. I want to thank you guys all for coming, and I'm going to um, start answering some questions here in a minute. But we have to go through that. We have to go through our little trivia thing. So what's the Navionics motto? Boat safer, fish smarter. <laughs> so. Egret bait, fish like a predator. There's a reason these companies have these mottos because they get it. They, that's why they're selling baits. You guys got to be predators. Um, Simrad, go with confidence. Um, between that and my Navionics chip, and I'm pretty fearless, which is probably a little scary. Um, I'm not. There's not too much that terrifies me when I get on the water. I feel like I can, I can pretty much navigate anywhere. But you got to have a good equipment to do that. Power pole, everybody knows the lady with the pink power poles and uh, swift, silent, and secure because, again, that all comes back to what we talked about. So I want to say thank you again, and I'm going to go up and see if I can answer these questions. I'll have to scroll back a ways, I guess, a little bit. No sound, no sound. Tallahassee, hear you, yes, yes. I don't think we have a lot of questions. Oh, somebody missed the question. No, I don't think we had a lot of questions. I think I had a hand raised. Okay, Brian, would you recommend a power pole in 10 foot of water? I have two 10 foot power pole blades on my boat. And uh, I like them, you know, I normally don't fish that deep, but when I'm coming into a dock or I'm doing anything, I, I know I can power pull that boat down and I'm always, I, I like the 10 foot blades. That's, that's what I've had. I had an eight, I had eight foot, I guess last year. Um, yeah, I think it really depends upon the size of your boat. Cause like I run it, I have a 234 tournament this year and I need the 10 foot blades. I, because I think they just, I can really dig those things into the mud and it holds that size of a boat better. Now, if you have a, if you have a technical polling skiff, you don't need a 10 foot blade, you know. I really don't think it has so much to do with the, the depth of the water that you're fishing. I think it has a whole lot more to do with the size of your boat. And uh, you got to think about if you get in wind, what's going to hold it? What's going to hold you where you need to be? And power pole may tell me I'm all wet on that, but that's, that's what works for me. So black bait and stained water. Yeah, it will. But um, Stained and, stained and dirty water are, are completely different. You know, we've talked about that iced tea looking stuff. That's where you're going to want to use that new penny um, color because, again, it kind of matches in. You got to think about 
you catch redfish in the ocean, they're more white. You catch them in the marsh, they're more pumpkin or dark brown color. Your bait's going to do the same thing. Think about matching your bait to the color of that water because all of nature camouflages itself. So like say white always works and I don't know why. I guess it just takes on a different tinge with all of that. But in stained water, I would really say more the new penny. And in, in dirty water, um, if that's where you're, you know, kind of have to fish, then I would use the dark baits there. Aaron Davis, I fish with fish stick rods too. <laughs> I know, yeah. Make sure you change your smoke alarm batteries. That's not my smoke alarm. That's my African gray, gray parrot, <laughs> Socrates. <laughs> All right, I tried to take notes. Yes, the webinar was recorded tonight and it will be on the Navionics website. I'm sure it'll be up probably in the next day or so. So anyway, I wanna thank you guys all for coming and being patient. I know it got a little bit long, but I'm passionate about fishing. I love to talk about it and I love to do it. So um, you can always email me through my website, teamearlydetection.com. And uh, my phone number is also listed on there. If you have any questions, give me a shout. Thank you, Eric, too. Um, I appreciate it. And uh, I'll be at the Biloxi Boat Show, the Mobile Boat Show, and uh, what's the one in Orange Beach? The Wharf. I'll be doing speaking there, too. So if any guys are close around there, be sure to stop and say hi and shake my hand, and, and we'll talk about fishing. So I guess if that's it, you guys have a great evening. Thank you for spending some time with me. And uh, I hope to put together another webinar here pretty soon. All right. Thank you.